Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> so we'll get started. Um, I'm sure we'll have some folks join us as we get going, but wanted to make sure we take advantage of our time together. Um, we have a great panel um, that will be um, discussing some really important information we'd like the community to have available. Um, my name is Alexandra Nova. I'm the Deputy Director for the Lawrence Partnership. Um, for those new to our organization, we are a private-public um, collaboration that focuses on fostering equitable and inclusive economic development for the city of Lawrence. Um, I want to take a moment before um, we get started with the program. Um, this event is set up as a webinar, um, but please feel free to use the chat function to interact. Um, joining this uh, event is also other members of my team, my executive director, Derek Mitchell, and also Karina Calderon. So please feel free to um, use the chat feature to interact with us. Um, want to take a, a brief moment to also thank our um, partners um, that are joining us today, our board of directors, and express just our most sincere gratitude for all our essential workers, nonprofit, corporate, um, public sector leaders that have been working tirelessly since this pandemic hit um, to assist our community in so many different ways. Um, so just wanted to kick off this event, um, just letting you know how grateful we are for all your work um, in, in assisting our community. Um, you know, in our capacity as conveners, we wanted to take a moment and partner with the Greater Lawrence Family Health Center um, in recognition of where our community is in terms of uh, COVID-19 um, number of cases and, and just the impact it's having um, across the board um, to our, with our community members to bring some really um, good information, um, upda updates, and also to just um, have front, some of these front like frontline doctors um, share um, what they are seeing. And, inf and, and we hope that you take advantage of, of this opportunity, ask questions via the chat. Um, our hope is that you leave this event equipped with information, not only for yourself, for your families, but also for other members of the community that you interact with. Um, last but not least, I just wanna again, express our gratitude to the Greater Lawrence Family Health Center, um, a partner not only for um, this particular event, but um, of the Lawrence Partnership and the community of Lawrence. Um, to get us started and introduce our panelists and our conversation today, um, allow me to introduce Rich Napolitano. He is the Senior Vice President and Chief Strategy Officer at the Greater Lawrence Family Health Center, um, but Rich is also um, the Chair of our Lawrence Partnership Network. Um, so I'll, I'll leave you in good hands with Rich. Please encourage everyone to use the chat for questions um, and enjoy today's presentation. Thank you. Oh, that's great. Thanks, Alex. Thanks so much. Um, you know, I'm not going to take too much time. I just want to thank everybody for signing on today. Um, thrilled to have my three colleagues here from the Health Center to talk a little bit about COVID um, and, and what we're experiencing right now, what we're going to be experiencing probably in the near, not too distant future also, unfortunately, and also share some stories um, of, of things that are happening. Um, as they experience them on, on the front line. Um, so I'm happy to, you know, I'm gonna turn it over in a second to our, um, to um, uh, Zandra Kelly. She's our chief medical officer. She's been with the health center for over 17 years. Um, she graduated from our Lawrence Family Medicine Residency Program and uh, fortunate for us and for Lawrence, she never left. Um, and uh, she's been a great asset for, for the health center and um, I'm sure you'll find all the information that she's going to share today very helpful. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to her now. And then I will um, moderate uh, the questions as they come in, um, you know, during the hour that we're together. So thanks so much. And Zandra, off to you. Thanks so much, Rich. And um, thank you to all of you for spending your time with us today and allowing us to share a bit about what's been happening um, for the health center and for our population um, surrounding our Greater Lawrence Family Health Center. Um, and I also wanna thank you for everything that you're doing, everything that you're doing in the community and for um, 
you know, just making sure that we're masking, we're distancing, all those things that we need to do to try to help um, curb this pandemic as we um, certainly are into our second surge um, right now. So I'm going to share my screen so that we can um, take a, a bit of a look at some of the data that we are seeing on a regular basis that help us to make some of the decisions and um, figure out how we're going to manage moving forward as we um, encounter this pandemic that is um, certainly, I hope, only once in a lifetime. Um, so this is definitely a new experience for most of us. Um, you know, we did never got training specifically and how to handle these types of major catastrophic events across the entire world. So we're all learning as we go, but we certainly know a lot more now than we did um, starting this past uh, March when we really saw it hit our area. And so we have a lot more experience to be able to bring with us during this um, second surge. So I'm just going to uh, share my screen um, and um, hopefully um, you'll be able to see um, the weekly report that's put out by Massachusetts. Um, many of you probably see this regularly, um, but they update this once a week, usually on Thursdays, and it's on the mass.gov website. Um, so you can see down here is Lawrence in this, um, uh, we are in the red here, and it says how many cases uh, we've had in the last two weeks. So this is the case count um, for the last 14 days in terms of how many people have tested positive in our area. Um, about a week or so ago, this was in the 60s, so it is going up uh, fairly rapidly. This is the number of um, positive cases on average per 100,000 people um, in our area. Um, and it is higher than it was before. And this is the um, positivity rate overall for the past two weeks. It's showing 11.78%. Um, but I am also going to share with you data that we have that we track for our own patients here at the Greater Lawrence Family Health Center. And we serve not only Lawrence, but our some surrounding communities as well. Um, and hopefully you can see here that our um, positivity rate in the last seven days on average is actually around 20%. So that means that one in five of our patients who have been tested for coronavirus are coming out positive. Um, and you'll be able to see, um, I'm going to scroll down a little bit. Um, this is the, um, down here, the July to early August timeframe, when you can see that the number of people testing positive was more around two to three percent. Um, and how much we have increased since then. And in the last uh, two weeks, we have really seen our weekly um, average to be at 20% or higher. So that has been a significant change and certainly signifies for us that we are in the second surge um, in our area. I can also tell you that, you know, um, the hospitals in our surrounding area, just in the last three or four days, um, have seen a significant increase in the number of patients who are being admitted um, with coronavirus. Um, I can say though that there are, the treatment availability um, is uh, better than it was back in the March to June timeframe um, when we really had our first surge going on. Um, it's, it's not clear exactly how effective um, the medication strategies that we're using now um, are, but we definitely have more than we did in the past. Um, and so we are seeing more patients who are being admitted for potential treatment, um, which is um, a positive thing that we have, we have something that we can uh, work with on the inpatient setting. Um, <clears throat> I'll also share with you uh, that the demographic we think for people who have coronavirus uh, this time around is a bit different from last time. Uh, this is the state's um, daily indicators that they put up, um, again, on their website, mass.gov. And you'll see there, there's a huge um, percentage of those who are actually testing positive now are in the younger age brackets, whereas those who are greater than 70 is a much smaller um, percentage of those who are testing positive for coronavirus. And so this, um, 
what can be fairly difficult about this, I think, is um, these younger folks are also the ones that are probably out and about and maybe asymptomatic and able to spread uh, the disease to others. Um, and there is such a huge range of disease manifestations um, for people who have coronavirus. So some people, as you know, don't really have much for symptoms and um, some people get severely ill um, or die from it. So I think that that's one of the things that has made this illness particularly difficult to control is that people can walk around and spread it without having any idea that they have it to begin with. Um, so, uh, you know, this younger uh, cohort of, of folks that we're seeing now who are testing positive um, it is really a, a bit more difficult to, especially with the fatigue that everyone's feeling with staying at home um, and not being able to gather. Um, we're definitely seeing a lot more of that happen. Um, and so it's, it's become uh, more difficult to control than it, than it may have been otherwise. Um, so certainly, um, Thank you for all of your masking and distancing and please continue to encourage others to wear their masks at all times um, and make sure that their gatherings are very small, if at all, um, and uh, that they are keeping distance um, from others, which I know is hard. Um, here at the Health Center, I'll also mention that, you know, of course we had a huge upswing and did um, uh, close to probably 90% um, or so of our visits via telehealth in the springtime. Um, and now we're about to 50-50, so we are still doing a significant amount of telehealth visits, meaning the patient does not actually have to come into our clinic physically in order to receive medical care um, from our clinical staff. Um, I would imagine as the um, days and weeks march on here that we will be increasing the amount of telehealth that we are doing um, and uh, decreasing the number of in-person in visits to encourage people to understand they don't have to leave their homes. There's a lot that we can do for people um, via telehealth. Um, and that uh, this is a, a new modality that we now have that's been very uh, well supported by the state. Um, and you know, I, I uh, just wanna thank all of those who did so much work um, on making sure that we can get telehealth up and running um, at all uh, places across the state in Massachusetts. So, that's um, been a great way for us to be able to provide medical care um, without needing to bring people into the clinic. Um, I'll also just mention that, of course, I'm sure there's a lot of questions and uh, a lot of things coming up regarding vaccine. There's been a number of announcements that came out in the last week or so. Um, we are certainly preparing and primed to um, be able to distribute and um, give vaccine. Um, I'm also having a lot of conversations with the state about how we can put out um, educational resources to people so that they can understand um, what we're providing with the vaccine and sort of help people to um, feel confident and good about um, using the vaccine moving forward. Um, so whichever ones um, come into play and hopefully multiple at the same time so we will have more to distribute. Um, so those are things that are coming in the, in the months ahead, but certainly the preparation work is going on right now and there's a lot of conversation about how we would do um, the best uh, distribution possible. Um, so I'm going to leave it there with those uh, sort of overview comments, but I'm sure that a, a lot of um, what Dr. Tu and Roy, one of our fourth year um, uh, medical residents and a family physician, and also um, Dr. Jenny Summers, one of our family physicians and faculty members at our residency program, um, have a lot to share with you in terms of what this has looked like um, on the front lines for our patients and for our staff. So I'm gonna uh, turn it over to Tuin um, if you wanna go ahead and um, share with uh, folks um, what you've been seeing. Sure, thank you, Zandra. Um, uh, like uh, Dr. Kelly mentioned, my name is Tuin. I am a fourth year resident. Um, and I know the idea of residency sometimes is not known to everyone. So just a quick overview. After finishing uh, medical school, all doctors have a uh, extended training 
um, and a lot of us have chosen to do it here at Lawrence. Um, what that allows us to do as residents is uh, we're involved in all sorts of the patient care here in Lawrence. Um, so we work in the clinic, but we also work in the hospital, work in labor and delivery, um, and work on the pediatrics floor. So a lot, myself and a lot of the residents um, as well, we're able to sort of see how things kind of picked up um, over the spring with COVID. Um, so I guess I can talk briefly about my experience, but I think um, it's helpful. I know I, a lot of people probably have a lot of questions. Um, my experience um, in March was, I think, um, sort of similar to many physicians in the area, um, just the unknown and the unexpected, not knowing exactly what um, was going to happen. Um, specifically, um, I do remember thinking we were about two weeks behind New York City, and so seeing what was going on in New York City and the fear of what was to come uh, was definitely one of those feelings that we had. Um, and I know I've met a lot of patients that had uh, shared a lot of that similar sort of thoughts of we're not sure what was coming. And I think um, that was the the unknown, uh, I think, was the, the sort of feeling that rang through all of um, the spring for us. Um, as residents, we helped out in the clinic and we also helped out on telehealth and took care of a lot of patients um, that I called in. Um, but we were also one of the ones taking care of um, our COVID patients that were in the hospital itself. Um, so Lawrence General um, took care of a large number of COVID patients. And unfortunately, our area was pretty hard hit. Um, and the hospital had converted, um, pretty much converted completely over to taking care of COVID patients and um, had created a specific ward for just COVID patients. Um, and this ward was um, staffed by a lot of the residents um, in the residency as well. And um, I could definitely go into stories, and I know Dr. Summers has <laughs> some thoughts about that too, but that was definitely a very, very interesting experience um, because, like I said, as residents, we were able to see um, all the entire spectrum of disease. So um, like we had mentioned before, COVID, unfortunately, has a large, uh, a wide spectrum of how um, it affected people. Um, and so we would be seeing people in clinic or on phone calls that just had a mild cold. Um, but then we were also seeing a lot of patients um, that were in the hospital that were not really making it. And so seeing that dichotomy and that spread of the disease was really um, sort of underscored the experience for a lot of us um, as residents, but also I think a lot of the physicians here as well. Um, I think I'll let Dr. Summers talk a little bit more and then we can probably answer some more specific questions because we can talk you know, at length about anything, but I would love to hear what people would like to know about. Hi, everybody. My name is Jenny Summers. I'm actually on the inpatient medicine service right now, um, which is why I'm in a call room and wearing my scrub cap and my scrubs right now. Um, I would echo a lot of what Tuin said. There was a lot of unknown and in medicine, we learn like algorithms, which are sort of like recipes. So you have a diagnosis and you have your treatments that you can kind of choose. It's more like cooking than baking. It's, there's a little bit of an art to it. You can, you can change things a little bit to make, to fit each individual patient. Um, and with COVID, there wasn't an algorithm. There wasn't a recipe. We didn't know what we were dealing with, but the patients, followed a similar course sometimes. Sometimes they would stray very widely. And um, it was difficult to predict, especially in the beginning, who had the virus when they came into the hospital. Um, and I think that was really scary. I think that when you, when you know the recipes or the algorithms and you know the plan ahead of time because you've prepared and you have your set of knowledge, um, you can kind of think about what your day is going to look like. But in the setting of COVID, we didn't we didn't know the recipe and we didn't know what was going to happen with the patients. We didn't really know the course of the disease. And so many of us were just reading and trying to learn um, as much as we possibly could and make our 
new plan. Um, I was lucky enough to be on that COVID planning team where we met um, weekly uh, before the surge and during the surge to discuss how to treat patients in the hospital when they arrived there and who needed to be in the hospital. Um, and for me, that gave me a lot of peace of mind because at least I was making a plan. I think doctors have to kind of have some sense of control, or at least I feel like I need to have some sense of control. And that helped me feel better as we were moving through the surge um, to create a plan and an a algorithm and, um, and, and making specific decisions about individual patients. The other thing I would like to bring up in general is sort of the, the trauma that the community experienced at large. Um, we, ha we lost a lot of lives here in Lawrence and uh, many of us in the hospital had never seen that kind of loss of life at that magnitude ever before. And um, that was difficult on many levels, but as an attending, it was very difficult because you dealt with your own grief, your residents' grief as they walked through the process, the family's grief, and then the patients themselves because they didn't know what they were entering into. Um, I agree with Dr. Kelly that it seems a little bit better. We have a better recipe. We have a better algorithm. Patients don't seem to be succumbing to the disease quite as quickly as they were before, um, but it's still pretty scary out here, I'd say. Uh, Dr. Summers, if, if, if I could just add, um, I'm just curious in terms of your thoughts. You mentioned trauma, and I mean, personally for me, um, I think once the, you know, we were sort of mandated to be home and we were seeing these numbers of, of folks um, dying um, due to the, to the virus, um, I think, uh, you know, from a cultural perspective, um, you know, come from a Dominican um, family and the loss of a, of a, of a family member um, usually the grieving process is done as, you know, in, in very large groups of family, you know, family member gathers. And I think, you know, it's kind of one of my biggest sort of fears in, as I and my own family navigate through the pandemic. And just curious, you know, being in the front line, you talked about that trauma, you know, is there anything you can, anything else you can share with us? And even in terms of how some of our families can, can deal and understand um, some of that impact. I think that's one of the saddest things about this is that um, most communities and cultures celebrate in big groups after death of loved ones. And, and it really is very difficult in the setting of COVID. Also difficult for um, the hospital staff to watch people pass away without their family members. Um, I think the use of technology, I was reflecting on this back in March and I still think now the fact that we can use Zoom and video chats, which was something of a figment of imagination in my childhood, but the fact that we can do it is, um, it's the best that we have, but I agree it's not enough. I don't know if Dr. Roy or Dr. Kelly have any other thoughts about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree. I think one of the most difficult things um, is bearing witness to the trauma of our patients um, and their families. And um, during the pandemic, um, and even now, actually, visitors are not allowed in the hospital. Um, and it's extremely difficult to um, be a surrogate family member um, for, for those patients that are there. Um, and like Dr. Summers mentioned, you know, there were patients that would pass away on their own. And I think that takes a toll on, on everybody involved. Um, but, and, and I agree, you know, it's, it's just such a community thing um, when somebody passes away. Um, and I found that the families that, that really um, had a, I don't want to say rewarding experience, but had a more fulfilling experience for the families that stayed together, um, but use technology to do so. So, 
you know, I had several different families that would have multiple, you know, Zoom conversations like this and just have like a big screen uh, with the patient. And it's not the same. It's not um, that personal touch. Um, and it's still hard to see. But um, there were those families I feel felt um, closer, um, even though they were distance and were able to use the technology in a way. Um, and the families, you know, to answer your first question, I, I feel the families that, um, I, I don't want to say more successful, but families that had more tools uh, were the ones that sort of talked about some of this beforehand. Um, and I think it's hard as a family to think about this, but um, families that had talked with their family members and their loved ones about what the next few days might look like um, together before they were separated um, were better equipped to sort of manage things as they went along. Um, but yeah, I don't think there's an easy way to say that there's one quick, <laughs> one quick silver bullet that makes this an easy, uh, easy experience. Thank you. I, I just know that, um, you know, it's a, it's, it's sort of a difficult, I guess, perspective to, to consider if you haven't experienced it, but, um, you know, I just wanted to share it with, with everyone and hear your thoughts on it. So I do have, um, I do have a few questions that have come through um, the Q and A, as well as some questions that were, were, um, sent to us in the pre-registration process. So uh, the first question that I have here is someone writes, I know more people who have gotten COVID-19 in the past three months than the first three months, but it seems less severe in their cases than in the few cases I was close to initially. Is there a new strain that might be more contagious, but less severe? So hi, I'll, I'll take that question. Um, this is Sandra. So I think in uh, the research that's been done since March, there are definitely new strains um, that have emerged, but I, and I think there is evidence that they're actually more highly contagious. I don't think there has been any evidence that they are less severe in nature. Um, my sense and in talking to others in the medical community is that the age range and the um, pre-existing conditions um, of people who are becoming infected now are uh, a lower age range with um, less pre-existing conditions. I think that a lot of those who know that they are high risk really are staying at home. Um, and those that are becoming infected who are higher risk, um, we often find are getting it within their own home. So we know we have a lot of multi-generational families that live together um, and uh, ways in which, you know, um, people have uh, cannot uh, be completely isolated from others. So, um, but we've definitely found, and even just in talking to the patients I talk to during our telehealth visits, um, so many of them tell me, you know, I haven't gone anywhere, you know, I'm, I'm not um, getting out. But um, the folks that are younger, you know, they're working, they're out every day, they're taking care of all the things for their families. Um, and so they are out and about much more. And um, the strain is definitely seems to transmit more easily than the one initially we had in, in the March timeframe. Mm -hmm. uh, another question. Um, do we have any update on what we're doing on the mobile health unit um, and COVID-19 services specifically? Yeah, so um, our mobile health unit has um, been continuing its services um, throughout, um, although we were doing a, a bit less um, as we had uh, to disperse a lot of our clinicians who normally would work on the mobile health unit to inpatient services and seeing patient, uh, patients on site who had respiratory illness at our clinic sites. Um, but we did continue um, seeing patients in the clinical uh, setting on our mobile health unit throughout. Um, but our mobile health unit also is participating um, when it's not doing uh, work clinically, um, seeing patients, um, it's participating in the Stop the Spread campaign testing. Um, so uh, those, uh, there are certain sessions where our mobile health unit is out in the community. Um, those times are actually posted on the Stop the Spread campaign website that the state has so that people can figure out um, where the mobile health unit will be for testing on which days and what the time frame is for that. Um, 
And so testing generally is something that um, definitely has uh, really uh, ramped up rapidly in our area. Um, most people probably know that Lawrence General Hospital is a part of the Stop the Spread campaign, as well as Greater Lawrence's mobile health unit. And we have a site at our Methuen Clinic um, that participates um, in an outdoor in the parking lot site um, uh, that participates in the Stop the Spread campaign. Uh, so uh, that is something that's certainly been ramped up in terms of COVID services. Um, I can say that also um, we are highly encouraging uh, everyone to get the flu vaccine this year um, to try to decrease the strain on the healthcare system as we see COVID increase. Um, so if we also had a huge surge in flu, um, that would certainly strain our healthcare system. Um, uh, and if we can avoid that um, by people getting their vaccination, um, that is something that is e extremely helpful and we are certainly encouraging everyone to do. So we have also provided um, uh, some vaccine uh, times uh, alongside the testing uh, with the Lawrence General site, for example, um, we were able to vaccinate over 200 people who were um, waiting to be tested uh, at the Lawrence General site um, on a Saturday a few weeks ago. So um, those are some of the other services um, that are being put out in the community. Um, and so we also have continued to have our clinic sites open for seeing folks that have any respiratory illness or something that could be considered to be uh, coronavirus-like as well as any acute visits. Um, and we plan to continue to have all of our clinic sites open moving forward as much as possible um, to continue to see patients um, who really need to be seen in person. And of course, we'll continue our telehealth moving forward. Um, this could be a question for any one of you. Um, one person asked is, what are our thoughts about the COVID-19 vaccination? I'm going to be the first in line. <laughs> I <laughs> said for, for many, um, many of these vaccination trials, and unfortunately, I didn't make it in any. Um, I think my demographic was not highly sought out. Um, but I think I'll weep when I get the vaccine. I'm so excited for it. I just, um, I think it will make me feel safer at work and I hope it will get us back to returning to a more normal life. Yeah, I second that. I um, am really looking forward to it. I think it'll help bring us back to a more of a sense of normalcy. And, you know, I know, I know there's a lot of talk out there and a lot of, um, you know, discussion about what it means to make a vaccine really quickly. Um, but I have a lot of faith in our science and our um, our science community, and especially kind of just the testing that goes behind it. And you know, vaccines work, and I have high hopes for this one. So I would be really, really excited. I'll just third that, but also um, comment that. Um, you know, it is certainly a very key component to this battle that we're having with the coronavirus. And I think um, generally we've all felt that this has been extremely isolating, um, not being able to, um, you know, gather as much as we would like to. Um, and especially moving into the holidays, there's so many uh, traditions and various gatherings that um, people will not be able to do in the same way. And the vaccine is, is one of many things I think that we're doing, but it is absolutely key um, to trying to get back to a place where we can feel more comfortable. And the more people that get it, the greater that possibility that we'll have enough immunity in the communities uh, surrounding us to be able to um, try to uh, have less isolation, um, be able to get out more, um, maybe even be able to give each other a hug someday moving forward. <laughs> So this is a work-related question. When, when to decide to allow a person to come back to work after they were sent to quarantine, but they already have a negative test? I think, Zandra, you and I talked about this yesterday. So. I can start and then Zandra can back me up. But um, mm -hmm. if they have a direct exposure, um, which I'm assuming based on this question, 14 days is the answer. Um, even with a negative test, because one in five of the tests will be falsely negative. 
So there's just a high false negative result on those tests. And while I think testing is an important part of the strategy, um, the quarantining and the isolation protocols also are it, in order to minimize community-based spread. I'll also just add to that, that if during those 14 days, someone is to develop symptoms, then um, they no longer are in what's called quarantine, but then they are in what's called isolation and actually um, need to separate themselves from um, others in a, in a more significant way for 10 days. Um, and they need to have, be fever free and symptom, re you know, basically resolved for at least 24 hours before going back to work. I'm Rich, I wanted to kind of add uh, a question there while we're speaking about testing, um, you know, and, and the holidays. Um, uh, many folks are considering um, simply asking family members to do a rapid test before um, going to, to a family gathering or friends, you know, friends, friends giving, right? Mm -hmm. um, now, I, I've, I've personally read a lot about um, how this is not 100% um, accurate that because um, you might test negative, but uh, for that particular day, um, do you mind commenting a little bit about that process? And, you know, is that something you still recommend as a preventative measure? Or is there anything like to add to that, such as quarantining um, for a specific amount of time before going to these family gatherings? I can try to. And um, so I, this is very personal and each family will have to make these decisions based on their own personal situation. But I will tell you that with my 65 year old parents, I will not be testing and then going to see them inside their house for a meal because I am too afraid of that false negative test because because there is such a high prevalence of a false negative test. I think if you were planning on going to an in-person meal and following the current Massachusetts guidelines, the in-person meal inside would have to be less than 10 people. And um, I would recommend a two week quarantine and a fairly strict one, meaning not going to work, not going anywhere ordering your groceries and having them delivered before going in person um, with others. It's, it's very difficult. I think the rapid testing strategies would mitigate spread. I think it would reduce the amount of spread. So that's why I kind of think it's a personal decision, but I still think the risk is very high that there could be one person that has it. I was reading something the other day saying that the prevalence of the COVID-19 virus is so high right now, if you get together with 10 people, there's a 25% chance that somebody in that group would have COVID. Thank you, um, Dr. Summers. And I, I would just add to that, that as she said, um, there is a one in five chance that someone who gets a negative test is actually not negative, that they, they actually have the virus. Um, so that's what makes testing um, very difficult as a marker for feeling like um, you could gather with a group of people. Um, the other thing that I'll mention is there are different types of tests. Um, that one in five chance that we're referring to is a PCR test. Um, those are the tests that usually take um, at least, you know, 12 to 24 hours or something to get your result back. Um, they're not uh, usually those rapid tests. Um, and those are considered the standard of care. Most of those tests have about a one in five chance of being falsely negative. But there's also antigen tests. Um, and those, a lot of the rapid turnaround, 15 minutes, um, you'll get your result tests, um, have a higher false negative rate, some of them around 30% instead of the 20%. So, um, you know, that's, that's another thing to keep in mind. I think there may be a lot of people who are getting antigen tests, and the chance of having a falsely um, negative test is even higher. 
Um, I'll, I'll also uh, just mention that in what we see in the medical community, um, what we see is not necessarily people getting um, COVID um, when they're at work, um, you know, within our institutions. Most of the time, the people that, the, the staff that we have that come out positive and have symptoms um, have gotten it outside of the workplace, um, mostly with their own gatherings um, with friends and family. So um, that definitely does seem to be one of the higher risk activities um, that people can do is to gather with those that are not a part of their immediate family, not people that they normally live with every day, but bringing in more people um, that are not a part of their normal household and having those gatherings. That's where we're seeing actually the most spread occur, um, which is why I think um, the Massachusetts government has set forth a lot of the guidelines that they have to try to encourage people to understand that um, and to try to um, you know, mitigate their risk by making decisions that would help them to not be exposed. Um, Sandra, you might be able to answer this. I know, um, I don't know if it, you covered it during your, the statistics that you were sharing, but what trajectory is the mortality rate taking right now? That's really interesting. And maybe I'll, I'll ask um, either uh, Dr. Roy or Summers to comment as well, but um, we are definitely not currently seeing as many deaths or even um, severely ill patients um, in the intensive care units. Most of the patients who are admitted at the hospital are um, at, on regular floors or what we might call med medical surgical floors and not in intensive care. And again, I think that that is likely reflective of the age and um, other uh, characteristics of the people who actually are becoming infected and then become admitted to the hospital. Um, so I would imagine as we move ahead um, with the surge, and again, as more people become positive, it will be very hard for those um, more at risk patients who are staying at home. It will be harder for them to avoid contact with people who have the virus. Um, so I'm afraid that we will see um, an increase as time moves on um, because again, it's very, very difficult for our elderly um, to isolate themselves completely um, from others in their family and others that would help them you know, day to day, and they may actually live with those with those folks. So um, I think that uh, I have concern that we will see it increase, although we have not seen too much of an increase thus far. And I'll, I'll see if um, Dr. Roy or Summers have any further comments. Yeah, I know Dr. Summers is in the hospital, so she can probably give us some more uh, comments on that. But I, yeah, I, I would say um, the discussion about mortality, especially when you read about it in the news, is kind of hard to really piece apart, um, mostly because of what Dr. Kelly said, you know, we can't look at everybody as one big group. Um, there are groups of people that are higher risk. Um, and we now know COVID is out in a lot of a younger population who might not be getting a sick, but can pass it along to those populations that are higher at risk. And I think part of what um, at the beginning is that there was a lot of unknown and we also just didn't have as much testing. So I think it was harder to tell who had what. Um, and now we are in a better position to kind of figure that out. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to echo what Dr. Kelly said is while it might look at uh, the numbers look like the mortality is going down. Um, and while we are seeing fewer of those higher um, kind of mortality patients in the hospital at this exact moment, um, the populations that are at risk are still at risk. Um, and they're still um, can have very, very adverse effects, the very bad effects from this virus. Um, and I don't think that is going to change. I don't think that's going to get better. Um, and I also fear that, you know, we might be seeing sicker and sicker people in the hospital again when, you know, we let our guards down um, because, you know, we are a community and people live in, in a community and live together. And, and it's really hard to separate ourselves. And I think when that happens, those higher risk groups can be affected again, unfortunately. I don't really have anything to add. My assumption is that when this is all over, it will end up being about the same. 
around one to three percent like we saw in the spring. Um, but maybe I'm wrong and I hope I am. Um, another question is, um, we hear of issues in healthcare balancing COVID-19 services with basic ongoing healthcare services. What are healthcare organizations like GLFHC, how are they handling that and how is it affecting the care? Yeah, that is a really great question. And definitely we did see that uh, COVID did push aside a lot of the care that people would normally seek. Um, so for example, in the spring, we saw fewer admissions for things like heart attacks and um, other things that are generally very common in the population, um, at least from an inpatient um, medical perspective. Um, but those uh, things seemingly almost went away when, when COVID was, was really um, surging in the spring. I think um, in terms of our outpatient setting though, um, in primary care, um, we definitely uh, felt the need to get a lot of people in for their regular care, for their diabetes, their hypertension, their um, high cholesterol management, um, because we, we did close um, and we're not seeing as many uh, in-person visits um, for a period of time. We were doing a lot of telehealth, um, but uh, I think that people did um, sort of lose uh, a little bit of that link um, to uh, their um, primary health care system and maybe were afraid to come in. Even we, we had for a long period of time patients who just they, they did not want to come into the health center um, because as a medical facility, you know, they, and they're staying home anyway um, and did not want to um, increase their risk for exposure. So we definitely had uh, a lot of patients who um, now need to catch up um, on things like mammograms and colon cancer screening and um, cervical cancer screening and things that we do regularly. So we're doing all of that now um, and we're doing our best to um, try to catch up with all of those patients who really do need to come in person to have those things done. Um, another question is, is there a plan for a vaccine campaign since so many are skeptical? Yeah, actually, there's a lot of discussion going on um, at the state level right now as well. And we are um, talking with them about what kinds of educational um, things that they can put in place so that all of the medical communities in the state um, can send the same message and can use the same materials to be able to share with the community the benefits um, and the um, you know, the need to be able to um, get the vaccine out uh, and make sure that people feel comfortable um, actually having the vaccine. So there's definitely a lot of planning going on right now. There's a lot of planning going on regarding education, but also about distribution. Um, and we really hope that, um, you know, people will go to their um, medical home and will uh, discuss with their medical um, community um, if they have any concerns about getting the vaccine and have that discussion with someone who knows them well and who knows their medical conditions. Um, because overall, um, you know, I think uh, we would love to have people feel very confident in being vaccinated, but I know that it's hard listening to um, a lot of the um, various information that's coming through. But hopefully if people have a primary care um, clinician that they can feel comfortable going and speaking with, um, that will be a little bit more of a, a moment where um, they can feel reassured um, and talk with someone who knows them well. Great, thank you. I have a, a question. We have a, a number of community leaders and, and just uh, folks invested in, in doing their part in how to stop the spread and, and, and educate or you know, provide resources to the community. Um, can you share anything that you're learning from COVID patients in terms of, you know, are they lacking knowledge about how they're getting the disease or you know, is, it, is it anything that can be useful for folks to understand how they can help um, stop the spread in the community? I guess I could start with that and Dr. Summers can finish. Um, I think interestingly, a lot of the COVID patients, uh, patients with COVID that I talked to um, didn't know where they got it. Um, and they kind of, 
it was interesting where like I stayed at home this entire time, but I only went to Market Basket once in the last two weeks. And so I think it's those moments of letting um, guard down. Um, I think by and large, a lot of our patients that we're seeing are trying to do their part, but you know, there's there's that lapse, there's something that goes on. You know, the, I had a couple of patients that specifically said I never left my house, just you know, my grandson, grandchild, whoever was coming in and out, and you know, that might have been what happened. We don't know. And so I think just echoing that the spread can spread really quickly, especially amongst people that are asymptomatic. Um, and places that where we kind of let our guard down a little bit, you know, at the grocery store or wherever, um, I, I think is probably where people get it. Um, kind of like Dr. Kelly said, a lot of people are very, very um, safe and trying to be very cognizant at work um, and very good about doing things at work because that's where we're at for most of the day. Um, but it's that quick errand to CVS, the quick errand to Market Basket that I think where people let their guard down. And un unfortunately, that might be where a lot of the spread is happening in the community. I think it's important to remember that it's not necessarily your behavior that will get you the virus. It's actually your neighbor's behavior or your friend's behavior or your family member's behavior. And that's why mask wearing is so important. If I'm wearing my mask, but somebody comes up to talk to me at the nurse's station or at the um, produce aisle at Market Basket, that person, if they're not wearing their mask correctly, could give it to me, even though I'm wearing my mask correctly. So I think that, um, and if you think about, I think a lot of our patients, when they came in in the beginning, we had a really high rate of infections through nursing homes and other institutions, which were just really horribly sad. And some of the patients were getting it from the nursing home and then giving it to their family members. I think family is a source of infection to each other. And I think that's why it's so important, especially with the holiday season, to keep that in mind. We're more likely to let our guard down with those that we love the most, our family members and our friends. And so I just want you to all be very careful. And it's not, again, it's not your behavior. It might be the other person's behavior that puts you at risk. I'll just um, add to that, that we definitely um, see, you know, mask wearing is a totally new thing um, for most people. So it, it can be difficult to be aware of how you are wearing your mask. Um, we see lots and lots of people, and you probably have too, who are walking around like this, which is, there are plenty of particles that can come out of the nose um, when you're wearing it not covering the entire face. Um, people also wear it like this, in which case it is clearly not um, protecting the other people around me from respiratory particles that could come out of my nose or mouth. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, we, you know, we remind folks in, in our clinic a lot to, you know, it'll come down here. And a lot of them, they don't fit that well. So while you're talking, they fall down and then people have to put it back up. Um, I've also seen many times, you know, it can be uncomfortable to talk to people through a mask. So I've seen, I think it's almost unconscious, you know, they have the mask on, but they want to talk. And so they'll take it down so that they can talk more clearly to people. And I don't, I don't get the sense that they maybe even noticed that they, that, that they took it down because, you know, this is strange, right? <laughs> to talk to people with a mask over your face. So I think some of these things have made it, um, you know, we're still getting used to um, all of these things. And I think that's what sometimes makes it hard if you are out and about, you know, you know, you don't know all the people around you. I don't know if people go around saying, can you put your mask up <laughs> above your nose, you know, while I'm walking by you. Um, so I think those are some of the things while, you know, people are, I think, doing a great job of wearing masks and trying to keep their distance. Um, there's, there's, of course, when you ask everybody to do it, there's going to be a variety of ways in which um, people um, understand how to do it and um, are able to pay attention to how they're, how they're utilizing their mask. Um, we have another testing question can, asking if you could comment on the newly approved at home test and is there any info on false negatives statistics and what about availability? 
So I don't um, know the specifics for that particular test per se, but um, I believe the one that's probably being referred to is an antigen test. And so again, um, those tests generally have a higher false negative rate than the gold standard PCR tests. Um, so those ones, I, I did see one of my neighbors told me about one that's available through Costco to order, um, and it is an antigen uh, test. So, um, you know, I, I think that uh, there's, there, you know, I can't say for sure. I don't think the test has been around long enough to even be able to tell you exactly um, what the false negative rate is, but generally for those types of tests, it's more around 30% uh, false negatives than the 20% that we see with the PCR test. Something I just wanted to mention about testing, I think that in the summer it was a little confusing because we were using testing more to be able to do stuff like with other people outside and that kind of stuff. And that was more effective when the prevalence was very low in the population. But now that the prevalence is high in the population, there's a greater risk for false negatives. And I just wanna make sure everybody understands that. Mm -hmm. It's different um, when the prevalence is very low, your negative is much more likely to be negative than when the prevalence in the population is higher. Great. Before we close, I think we have one time for one more question, and, and this actually came from someone before the um, before today's uh, webinar, but it also um, just someone else put it in the queue or a little bit earlier. And basically, it's saying how much they appreciate our willingness to share the feelings of fear and grief um, that you all talked about earlier. But in the public really tried to support during the first surge. But how can we be supportive with the ongoing situation? It is such a and remember that these are um, most of the folks on this are community leaders um, and they, they just want to play a role in, in how we can be more supportive um, of everything that's going on at the health center at the hospital and trying to stop the spread. So I think that's where the question is coming from. I am, I am so grateful for that question. I also want to just let everybody know that I'm also so grateful for my job. Like I was I really felt blessed to be able to serve in this way throughout this um, pandemic. And I um, appreciate so much how the, con the community has come together for us by delivering us lunch every once in a while and supporting local restaurants. I think, you know, staying home for the holidays would be my like number one, like please support us by staying home for the holidays. But then after that, you know, just keep doing what you're doing. You're all so amazing and we're just really lucky to do what we do. Or I feel that way. Thanks, I, I, I would say thank you so much for that comment and the question. Um, and uh, one of the things that could be um, that uh, you guys could help a lot with potentially is we do have constant um, concerns with staffing, even for things like the mobile testing tents and, and areas where, uh, you know, they're constantly looking for people who might have interest in doing that type of work. Also, um, contact tracing. And so if you know anyone, if uh, anyone's sort of looking for something um, along those lines or has, has time to um, contribute in that way, um, that is some uh, a place where I think we're all continually looking for um, folks that uh, have interest in having that type of, of job. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you guys know a lot of folks who um, could share that, that uh, spread that word around. Yeah, um, just quickly, uh, Alex, um, there was a question earlier. I thought we answered it. Um, we are looking at ways for the stop the spread testing. Someone asked if we we're going to be looking at increased hours. And I believe our community support services team here at the health center is looking at those opportunities. It's really becomes a, it's really a resource and staffing issue. So would, uh, to answer the question that came up earlier, we are looking because we do realize that the wait times are, are increasing. Um, I was over at the Pelham Street site yesterday and I could not believe the line. So we are, we are looking at that and what the possibilities could be. Now I'll turn it over to Alex. Okay. Thank you all so much, um, uh, Dr. Kelly, Joy, um, Dr. Summers, Rich. 
um, you know, thank you to all your staff for everything you guys are doing for our community. Um, to all the folks on the line that joined uh, this conversation, we hope that you found this information useful. Um, we will be compiling um, a list of resources together with Family Health Center, with our partners at Groundwork Lawrence, who are managing the We Are Lawrence website, um, that also um, includes a, 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 a large number of um, resources available to the community. Um, so we'll be sharing a, a follow-up. Um, this event was recorded, so we'll share a link as well. And please feel free to share it with anyone that might have missed it that you think this information would be useful for them to hear um, and, and have access to. Um, we hope you have a great rest of the day. Uh, look forward to staying in touch and providing more updates in terms of you know, how we can all contribute to helping our communities um, combat this pandemic. Thank you.